I'm Kelly Duncan, President of the Audubon Commission. I want to welcome all of you here today. Thank you for being here. This is a, a very important meeting to all of us associated with Audubon and obviously important to all of you and that's why you're here and thank you. As you know, we're looking to get your feedback as Audubon frames its vision for the future for Audubon Park. Your feedback is awfully important. It's, we need your feedback, we need your comments, we need uh, the, the reviews of, of what we're suggesting to, to be brought back to us so that we can frame a vision that works for us and works for all of you uh, as we go forward. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, Ron Foreman obviously is to my left, everyone knows Ron. Brent Wood and Bruce Hofer are both members of the Audubon Commission, uh, along with uh, Mark Ripple from uh, the SQ, law firm, uh, SQ Architecture Firm, uh, Dr. Willa Dumas, Dr. Ogden there, Field Ogden, and, and last, uh, uh, Ludovico Faoli, uh, all with the Audubon Commission. So I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Shemin Grant Saloy who is the Vice President of Marketing for the Audubon Nature Institute, and Shemin will take us through the process that we'll be going through today as we uh, get your comments and how this is, is being structured. So, Shemin. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Shemin Grant Saloy. I serve as the Vice President of Marketing here at Audubon Nature Institute. I'm just going to quickly outline the organizing principles behind how we are organizing our master plan process. So the, the first area of concern is preservation and heritage. And on that section, we'll be talking about sustaining and enhancing Audubon Park as a public amenity, evaluating its current use, and establishing strategic guidelines for new projects. Under the education and culture heading, we're going to discuss fostering opportunities for education and community outreach, as well as celebrating the cultural heritage of Audubon Park, which is a gem. Another organizing principle is access infrastructure and operations. So we are going to investigate improvements um, to the circulation and access, recommend strategies for water management, update the master plan documentation to the current status, and then identify means for securing long-term financial stability. A next organizing principle is recreation, entertainment, and wellness. So we are going to evaluate the use of recreational open space in Audubon Park and how we maintain and enhance um, the exercise and athletic facilities that um, are in the park. And then finally, we'll talk about environmental stewardship. We're going to conserve and enrich the landscape and the environment. We're going to evaluate the best practices for horticulture and, and for application. And we're going to preserve and augment the tree canopy. And so as we uh, progress with this plan, those are our general five organizing principles. And Mr. Mark uh, Ripple will take you from SQ Dumez Ripple, will take you through the process for the plan as well as the agenda for tonight's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Shemet. Uh, does the, the advancement work? Okay. There we go. Well, thank you all for being here uh, this evening. The, the weather was uh, looking a little bit questionable, and uh, it's great to see that it held off. A uh, show of hands, how many of you were here at the first meeting uh, that we had previously? All right, terrific. Well, thanks for coming back, and thanks for so many new faces uh, in the crowd. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we covered at the last meeting, but mostly talk about what we hope to achieve at this meeting and uh, the, the structure for the meeting. And first off, I wanted to introduce our design team. So I'm Mark Ripple, the principal at SQ Dumas Ripple Architects. Uh, we have a number of folks in the audience uh, with us, and maybe when I mention your name, you can stand up. Uh, so we have Tracy Lee, another principal at SQ Dumas. There's Tracy over there. Uh, Amanda Rivera. Uh, Amanda, one of our senior associates at the office. Uh, Marion Forbes. Where's Marion? Thank you. 
And uh, one of the questions that was raised at the last meeting was the landscape uh, design and master planning. Uh, that work effort is being headed up by Spockman Mossop Michaels, a local firm of, that has done work not just here in New Orleans, but throughout the country. And we have two representatives uh, from them. They're in the back, uh, Wes Michaels and Emily Bullock. Uh, they're over there on the corner, in the corner. Uh, so that's those, and all of us will be helping facilitate the, the meeting when we do the breakout sessions. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the process. Hopefully you can read this, but uh, this is the second of three community meetings. Uh, we had our first meeting uh, last month, and the primary goal of last month's meeting was to, to ask questions and to listen to gather information uh, from you, the people that use the, the park, people that care about the park and that understand it and coming from the, the user and the community's perspective. Uh, so it was primarily an opportunity for folks to stand up and talk about what their ideas were, what their concerns were, and what their vision of the park was as we move to the future. Uh, in addition to that, what we've been doing is a series of online surveys, and I can say this has been a huge success. We have, by current count, nearly 900 respondents that have checked in online and have provided information that is incredibly valuable to us, the design team, and to the Audubon Institute uh, to understand what it is that you care about, what matters uh, to you. And not surprisingly, the, the common theme was something that we touched on at the last meeting. How do we maintain and enhance these wonderful offerings of the park and do it in a way that honors the organizing principles of the park and the, the mission of the park? To maintain and enhance what is here. We heard that again and again. We don't necessarily need big expansion, upgrades, big ideas like that. How do we do what we're currently doing and doing it, do it as well as we possibly can? Uh, so that was the general theme, and that's what we're gathering from the, uh, from the community input. Uh, this evening will be to drill down further. So what we've done, oh, and I should clarify for those of you that were not at the last meeting, uh, this is the layout of the park. So to orient you, of course, the, the blue thing on the left is the river. On the far right-hand side is uh, St. Charles Avenue. The vertical line going right down the middle is Magazine Street. Uh, the master planning work does not involve uh, any aspects of either the golf course or the zoo. It is everything else uh, that, uh, that entails the park. And in order to simplify things, we have uh, represented the park in these three districts. So District 1 is furthest to your, to your left, which is the Mississippi, I'm sorry, District 1 is the St. Charles Exposition Walnut uh, area, primarily the perimeter condition between the residential area on three sides and the golf course. District two is the Magazine Street Corridor, and not surprisingly, one of the common themes that we're hearing again and again is, how do we improve accessibility and movement across? How do we create safe conditions for pedestrians, for cyclists? And uh, to that end, we will be talking a little bit later on tonight. We have a representative with the city that will be uh, from the city that will be telling us specifically what the thoughts are about the improvements to Magazine Street, because certainly all of that comes into play. How can we work with the city uh, while they're doing these improvements uh, to, uh, to the maximum benefit of the park? And then the third district, of course, is the Mississippi River View, uh, the fly, the soccer fields, uh, the tennis courts, the baseball uh, diamonds. And the, the common thematic element uh, in that discussion is how do we find appropriate balance? Uh, we have these formal programmed activities that are hugely successful, and we have more informal, unprogrammed activities. Uh, as we've said and heard it from many of you, you know, that's one of the best areas in the city where you can stand and look at the, the river batcher and experience the river. There are very few opportunities like that in this city, and that's, uh, that's something that we should embrace and cherish. So the goal in that district is how do we, is, is the balance correct? How can, what can we do to improve uh, that and to make it everything that it can possibly be? So what we've done is scheduled some, uh, some uh, group participation sessions. 
Uh, they are informal in nature, which means that we have five tables around the room. We'll talk about what each one uh, is involved with in a second. Uh, but as a woman had asked me earlier, she said, well, when I stay at a, sit at a table or stand at a table, do I have to stay there for the entire 45 minutes? The answer is no. This is informal. We will have at each of the tables, we'll have representatives from the design team and a representative from the Audubon Institute to help facilitate the conversation. It's designed to be interactive. We want to drill down on some of the specific issues that have come up that we hear as common thematic elements and we want to get your input and your ideas. And hopefully what we want to do is build a consensus, group consensus. Sometimes that's tough, but that's, that's our objective. Uh, it's structured informally so that if after 10 or 15 minutes you decide, okay, you've, you've said your piece with a certain area uh, or a certain aspect of the master plan or of the, one of the districts, you can have a cup of coffee or a, 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 I guess, do we have coffee? I guess it's uh, cookies and milk and, and refreshments. You can take a break and then move over to another uh, table. And we're going to do our best to keep it from being a free-for-all. We're going to try and add some, some degree of structure, but we want it to be flexible. We want it to be open. We want it to be engaging. We truly want your input. So the way we've structured it, it's rather interesting because we have these three districts, but we also have two overriding thematic elements that we kept hearing again and again, and we felt that they were important enough to where we address them as specific topics at a table. So as we had said, there are three districts, District 1, 2, and 3. So District 1, to remind you again, is the St. Charles Exposition Walnut District that surrounds uh, the golf course and adjacent to the residential area. And that table is over here in the corner uh, on my left-hand side. And we'll have uh, Marion and we'll have, Lan where's Lanny? Uh, I'm oh, there we go. So we'll have Marion and Lanny that will be assisting and facilitating that table if you're interested. Uh, table number two, the Magazine Street Corridor is over here on the right hand side. So we have Laurie is over there waving her hand and we've got Tracy Lee, Tracy, Tracy and Laurie will be manning that table. Uh, number three is the Riverview over here and we've got Ashley with the Audubon Institute and myself that will be facilitating that group. And then we have the two topics of significant conversation and interest uh, that we've broken out separately. Uh, that is table number, am I getting it right? Table number three, four, okay. Table number four, back here in the back, is looking at the entire uh, uh, Audubon Institute footprint and addressing issues of traffic, access, and safety holistically. And there was a very good question by another person before the meeting said, well, if I'm interested in traffic, but I'm interested really in just the traffic at Magazine Street, but I also want to know about bigger issues out at the fly or whatever, what do I do? Well, that's why we're designing it to be flexible. You can join in a conversation on Magazine Street and 15 or 20 minutes later, you can shift over and see what the, how the conversation is unfolding somewhere else. Uh, and the final uh, table, is education and culture, and that is table, what's the one left, four? Four, five, I'm sorry, uh, okay. Five is, yeah, five is traffic, four is education and culture. I should have had my cheat sheet here. Uh, and that came up again and again. We heard from Bob Thomas uh, at the last meeting. Is Bob here this evening? Uh, so Bob teaches at Loyola. It's fascinating to hear what they're doing in terms of continue, uh, uh, educational outreach, how he is using the park as this amazing uh, boots on the ground story about, uh, about environmental education and using the park uh, to do that. So it, it is a, a common thread throughout. It, it's fundamental to the mission of the, of the park and of the institute. So we felt it was significant enough to have it as a separate uh, conversation. So in addition to that, we have a number of things on the walls. We have maps, both site, Google, thank God for Google Earth, Google Earth maps, 
we have uh, site plans, we have photos to remind you of some of the conditions that uh, exist in each of these areas, and we have a series of triggering questions and comments. Some of them are driven by the organizing principles that we had touched on later, but some of them are simply open-ended questions where we want your thoughts and your input to hopefully trigger some good conversations. Uh, so before I break everybody up, is there any other general, any questions or any suggestions from our facilitators, anything that I didn't cover? Any questions about how we're doing it? Tracy? Yes, so we, it, this will be a 45-minute session. Uh, we will stop it promptly at 45 minutes. We'll have each of the facilitators then do five minute each report out. So I think that's another 30 minutes immediately after that where we will report out uh, what we've heard. Uh, anything else that I've forgotten? Okay, so with that, please go ahead and break up. Oh, I'm sorry, a question in the back. No, there is none. Okay. Yes. One more question. Is it time for public comment from the deputy? The time for public comment, you mean uh, this evening? Yes, that, I mean, that's the, the 45 minutes is for you to make your, your comments. So, and we want to memorialize those. You can write them down. We can jot them down. But that is the, the goal. Maybe I wasn't clear on that. That is the goal of the 45 minutes. Give us your comments. Give us your thoughts. Give us your concerns. Give us your ideas. And uh, have it uh, create a healthier conversation amongst the group. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and break up to the uh, tables that you're interested in. Thank you so much. So tell me about the particular issues that come up. It's parking and traffic? Park. They pay no attention to it. And then here's a, a, a Jeep, and there's a tree right here. So they're on the routes. Are you? Okay. 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 So the facilitators, if you all would come on up uh, some, somewhere up close, uh, and we're going to try and hold to the five-minute uh, limit. So District 1 was over here, so who is speaking on behalf of District 1? Marion? Marion, come on up. And thank you so much for uh, those of you that hopefully you got a lot out of this. Uh, it was incredibly engaging, in some cases uh, uh, more so than we anticipated. But the, the comments were phenomenal, and uh, we really, really appreciate your candid input. So Marion, District 1. Hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to second Mark's comment. Um, we got a lot of very interesting and very um, helpful comments throughout the entire 45 minute session. Um, so to recap, in the District 1 area, we got plenty or lots of uh, helpful comments and suggestions on drainage, and we definitely heard that loud and clear. So that's a big priority on our list. And a lot of um, helpful comments 
and interesting uh, discussions on safety and vehicular access in the District 1 area. Um, a lot of comments on being sure to care for the land and take the best care of our natural resources, which we definitely want to help do, and um, comments on lighting and how to navigate um, a balance between natural and artificial lighting uh, throughout the District 1 area. So those were the... Okay, thanks so much. And while we're on District 1, since I was less than five minutes, wanted to open it up. Any other specific uh, comments that, uh, that Marion did not touch on that are worth uh, repeating or expanding on? Any other comments there? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, District 2, uh, Tracy, come on up. Hi, everyone. Uh, District 2 is the Magazine Street Corridor, and the discussion around District 2 had everything to do with exactly that, Magazine Street. Um, the way that it bisects the park, the problems in uh, pedestrian and, and uh, cycling access crossing the street. So there was a lot of discussion about that, and that really dominated the discussion. We were fortunate enough to have a couple people from Public Works here, and they're going to speak a little later and perhaps can answer some of the questions that were asked in those discussions about the phasing and construction of the Magazine Street piece. Um, but associated that were, with that were um, questions and discussion about drainage, uh, but mostly it focused on the difficulties that having a very busy street bisecting a park presents. Um, we also had quite a bit of good discussion about Shelter 13 and a lot of divergent opinions about what should happen with it. Um, some people thought that it should be returned to what it originally was, a, a picnic shelter with bathrooms. Other people had other good ideas about what it could become. So that was an interesting conversation. We'll consider all of that as we move forward. And, and I guess perhaps one uh, slightly surprising thing that came out of the discussions was uh, an active conversation about how People who travel up Magazine Street trying to access the park who perhaps don't know their way around that well, um, the opinion was they get confused about where they're going. There isn't clear signage or direction that tells them where to go. And maybe that is adding to the traffic problem because they slow down to a crawl where they're trying to understand where's the zoo, where's the, the golf course, which way do I turn, where do I go. And that was a, a kind of new information to us. I think that that that's, uh, that's, seems to be more of an issue than we thought it was. Um, I think that those are the major topics that we discussed. Good, healthy conversation. And uh, I think we all look forward to hearing a little more from, uh, from the Public Works folks about the future for the Magazine Street project. Anything I missed, Laurie? Any questions about this part of the park that we can address now or any issues that we may not have identified in, uh, in our exhibit over there that you all think are important? Jack. And, and uh, not only um, improve the crossings, per, but perhaps add more, many more than there are now already. Uh, I think there are maybe four or five. Uh, the thought was that, that perhaps that, that's not enough. That uh, one way to try to deal with this conflict between the fast moving traffic and pedestrians is to perhaps consider putting even more interruptions there. And so, you know, I'll, I'll have to defer to the traffic engineers to help us understand what the implications of that are, but that was brought up as one possibility. Okay, thank you. Okay, and for uh, District uh, 3, it's a good segue because a lot of that conversation focused on traffic. Uh, we had a number of very lively conversations, not so surprisingly because it, it is a heavily programmed area. 
and as we had said, uh, leading into the conversation. Finding the right balance uh, is a challenging proposition. We have these wonderful uh, programs out there. The Park uh, the, the Audubon Institute uh, supports those programs and it gives great opportunities for kids in the, in the neighborhoods and throughout the city to participate. I didn't realize there are almost 6,000 uh, players uh, uh, on the, that play soccer out at the field. We had good representation from both soccer and from uh, uh, tennis. We heard from a number of uh, tennis uh, players. Uh, but the challenge, uh, I think the biggest challenge, which was not a surprise, was how do, are there ways in which we can improve uh, traffic. There are a few things that we probably can't control, which is things like the, uh, when, the, when the train is blocking your path for an hour and a half. Uh, Ron may have some pull with Public Belt Railroad, but uh, so the, we kept the group focused on the things that we might be able to control. There were a number of interesting ideas that were thrown out about the merits of one-way versus two-way uh, traffic, how we might uh, loop in, create a drop-off condition. Uh, the folks that play soccer remind us it's not just a matter of walking because when you're playing soccer, if you're unloading, you know, several kids and all of the equipment, uh, it's unreasonable to expect them to walk a, a big distance. So one of the suggestions is, is there a way that people could drop off and park elsewhere? Uh, the challenge quickly arose, or uh, uh, under, as we understood, that uh, the peak moments for soccer uh, are also quite often the peak moments for the zoo. So even though there's that wonderful zoo parking lot that you could imagine people could park and walk, in fact, during the, the peak moments coincide. Uh, so w the conclusion we reach is there aren't easy answers, but as Tracy mentioned, similar to Magazine Street, uh, having a parking consultant that will do a deep dive in that regard to figure out what can be done to improve what we have uh, and enhance what we have uh, is going to be a significant step. Uh, there was also a lot of conversation about finding the balance between cars, bikes, and people, and how can we create a more favorable environment for uh, bikes. We had a number of folks that talked about uh, uh, biking uh, upriver along the river's uh, edge and being able to extend bike paths into the park to make it more, uh, e easier for other me means of transportation uh, other than uh, cars, so we can kind of diversify a little bit uh, in that regard. Uh, there were a number of comments about concerns about the way in which parking happens, that despite signs, people are parking on the tree roots, which of course we know is, uh, is unacceptable. Uh, there were some kind of uh, ideas about, well, can we do uh, pedestrian overhead, uh, pedestrian bridges over the railroad to where if there is the hour and a half delay that people can get there by foot and maybe might uh, simultaneously reduce the traffic load because people will be not be parking uh, out at the fly. Uh, there were a number of comments about just the understanding how wonderful that water's edge is and could, uh, could we do more in terms of uh, safety concerns about people uh, climbing down you know, onto the rocky uh, areas? Uh, should there be something that protects uh, uh, the folks from, uh, from uh, falls and things? Uh, can we, in fact, uh, do better with trash collection? What does that look like? Uh, and Ashley, what else am I? I'm doing this randomly. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Oh, and I did, I'm sorry, and I didn't touch on uh, the folks that were here representing the tennis players contingent felt very strongly about the idea that could, in fact, there be resurfacing of some of the cor courts, but also could there be an expansion of tennis? And I shared candidly, certainly we're open, we're all ears, open to an understanding as to what represents the, uh, the common good. But as I mentioned to the, the folks that were uh, bringing up tennis, for every person that was talking about perhaps expanding tennis, there were others that were saying no more, we've got all the development we need. So again, trying to find that balance, there's, there's, 
in many ways, the, I guess the park is a victim of its own uh, success and finding ways to, uh, to enhance what we have rather than to continue to expand what we have. But it did focus primarily on parking and certainly having a parking consultant uh, look at that is gonna be a critical first step. I will also add that it came up once or twice a question about a comprehensive tree survey uh, at the park because the last tree survey I think that is on the website is from 10 or 12 years old. Ashley had shared that there is one that is being wrapped up as we speak. Is that correct, Ashley? Yes. So there will be very soon a, a tree survey that you can refer to. Uh, did I leave anything out? Any other comments or questions? Okay, so our next group, uh, group, oh yes. Some of the trees are the willows on the batcher. Just wanna make sure that's included. Okay. Right now they're flooded. Okay. Those trees. All right, thank you. he had mentioned, in case you didn't hear that, some of the trees are the willows on the batcher. And, and other, they probably have green ash and other things, but literally those willow trees and the other trees that are there are one of the major habitats along the edge of much of the Mississippi River, the lower Mississippi River, a major educational aspect to it. And they actually hold the ground together. In the willows, I was sharing that they're one of the earliest winter foods for the honeybees as far as pollen and nectar. But it's, it's a major educational aspect to it. I know it blocks part of the view. Maybe that can be worked with. But those are trees. Yeah, they're very vital. and. No maintenance is involved on your part. <laughs> sure, sure. And there was a com one of the comments was, can't we clear all that out? And my personal thought is that, I mean, that is part of the beautiful natural ecosystem of the river. And I think Bob Thomas had touched on that briefly at the last meeting that there's some wonderful stories about not just with the lagoon and the park itself, but because we have this wonderful access to the river, it's a great opportunity to be able to tell that story and tell it to our children for many, many years to come. Okay, yes, uh, one more comment, Jack. I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, but one thing that was prominent in the first meeting was the discussion of the opportunity to expand the river view upriver into uh, by incorporating the Biso towboat land. That's still under discussion, Ron, I've been working on it, but uh, uh, it's, it's something that uh, probably should not be left out of an aspirational master plan for Audubon Park, even though it doesn't seem entirely practical to do right now. Yes, thank you, Jack, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, group four, Amanda, come on down. Good evening. Um, we were table four, the um, education and culture side of the park. Um, we've, I've heard a lot of um, topics being discussed and covered already, which were things that we heard at our table, but I'll run through my notes anyway. Um, one of the first comments we heard was that um, we feel that the park should practice what they preach. They are a park. They have environment as a top priority. So we should be using sustainable products, um, that there are alternatives to plastics. I think straws were mentioned. Um, I was thinking trash bags. Let's make sure that those are environmentally friendly um, as possible. Um, and then also that there should be initiatives to save the environment. Um, let's see. No parking on tree root balls, which we just discussed. But in terms of education, the point was brought up why. Right now we, we have a picture that was handed to us that identified no parking on tree root balls and right next to that sign was a car parked on the tree root balls. And potentially if people understood why we were asking them not to park there, they might be a little more sensitive to that. So we should try to educate the public a little bit more there. Um, <laughs> Um, we want more signage, we heard, that educates the public about its history, um, direct its visitors a bit more. There was concerns about which paths are allowed to take and which are restricted, and that was specifically around the golf course and some of the paths, like if you're walking on the outside jogging path that goes around the golf course, 
are you allowed to veer off and take that little bridge that goes over? There's, people are not really sure about that. Um, there was a request for more signage potentially about the zoo itself, and I think that that could be a nice thing to help advertise the zoo and some of the animals that are in there. It could promote some more use of the zoo. Um, there was a question, could the golf course be um, kind of double as something else? Could there be a second purpose for it? Because it does take up a large area of the park itself, so um, could it also maybe double as a bird sanctuary or something else? Um, we should protect our natural amenities, no further development. Um, any tours that happen, this goes back to the educational side, any tours that happen, um, they should be small. Um, they, the um, person we spoke with would like the park to remain quiet and somewhat discreet. Um, more ongoing communication with public schools so that um, some of the programs that are already established, like the duck and bird chats, um, can be utilized more. So um, also more exercise stations. We know that the park right now is used by um, Tulane Public Health. Some public schools, they take their biology classes there, some items that Bob Thomas has mentioned in the past um, community meeting. And then also um, gardening programs, perhaps that can allow more of the community to help with keeping, uh, maybe maintaining gardens or getting more of the park planted. Um, there was a comment about um, a preference for lights being off when the park is closed to the public, and also that um, we think that we need more cohesive designs when it comes to the benches, trash cans, and signage. And my understanding of benches and trash cans is that something that is being maintained and, and replaced over time, so that might be something that's coming and maybe Audubon can speak more to that. That's what I have. Okay. Uh, table five, Wes, come on up. So our table was traffic, safety, and access, and um, one of the things that really stood out was there was very, li very little discussion about the traffic on St. Charles. There was a little bit of the discussion about the traffic along the Riverwalk, but there was tons of discussion about the traffic along Magazine. And so that became really the biggest piece of what the uh, table discussed. Um, there was comments about there's multiple modes of traffic from horses to pedestrians to cyclists to you know people who even you know are handicapped need uh, handicap accessible things and that that generally doesn't is not well marked there's no areas of refuge it's easier to get across St. Charles in a way even though it's wider and larger because there's some refuge there but that along St. Uh, along Magazine Street that, that it's really difficult because you sort of have to stand at the edge and then sort of dash across the traffic um, Lots of discussion about you know, the events, especially for the local residents, the people that live right in that neighborhood, that the events, the zoo, the concerts, and things like that cause a lot of issues with access to their homes, that there were some issues with emergency vehicle access for people along those areas. Um, and there were some thoughts about slower speed. Should we, when there's not a concert there, should we slow down the traffic on Magazine Street? And there was talk, uh, talk of, um, you know, should there be a traffic light along Magazine Street? Someone said, should there be a speed camera? But then someone wrote right over top of that, no more speed cameras. So, I mean, you know, it's a bigger debate, I think. Um, there was talk about even could we look at sort of the larger system of, you know, timing the lights, you know, on the surrounding lights, on, you know, the stop sign on River Road, the lights, you know, on Henry Clay and on, along Magazine Street. Is there sort of a bigger picture in terms of the traffic that might make it a little bit easier to make the traffic flow along Magazine? Um, and then there was even talk about, you know, the, in terms of the circulation, that the, people wanted more opportunities for meandering, or more opportunities for people to sort of have uh, different places to go that, you know, where they could get away from the cyclists and things like that, and it's a little bit more of a, you know, passive sort of pathway system. About security, we had not a lot of discussion about security, but one of the things that came up is to have the um, security officers be more visible, that their presence just, you know, if you see them, it's a more of a sense of security and a more sense of a safety. And then also the edge vegetation along the residential edges, along Walnut and Exposition, that sometimes those feel like they may be places for people to hide, and there was some discussion about that might, you know, be an issue. And then we had three, what I would call, categorized bold ideas. 
One was to extend the access along River Road down into this sort of almost where the fly comes into uh, the zoo parking lot and have access out the side of the zoo parking lot. It's sort of hard to see there, but if you go up River Road that way. The second bold idea was to connect Chapatulas all the way to River Road along the railroad so that there would be a new access piece. And the final bold idea that I just thought was really interesting was glowing paving so that you could have, you know, this special glowing paving that would just be lined the edge of the pathways. You could see, you know, you could, if you're jogging in the evenings or things like this, that you wouldn't trip and fall. So sum it up, most of it was really about Magazine Street. And, you know, I think that's been a common theme through most of the things we've heard in, in all the different um, areas. So that's what I got. Okay, thanks, Wes. Uh, and we do still have uh, the uh, City Public Works. Uh, Nikki Polk is still here, is that correct, Tracy? Do we? Yes, okay, there we go, thank you. Uh, so we did, as we mentioned, since Magazine Street is so central to this conversation, we thought it'd be important to hear from the City of New Orleans and get a better understanding of the uh, project that's entailed. Thank you. everyone. My name is Nikki Polk. I actually work for the Capital Improvement Program, Roadwork NOLA, and we actually work with DPW and Sewage and Water Board as we move forth with several projects, um, mainly the um, FEMA-funded projects, but also joint city and state projects like the Magazine Street Corridor. I actually have Grayson Fleming, who is the engineer for the Magazine Street project. And I just wanted to um, give you a few timelines and possibly Grace and I can answer any questions you may have. So it's a two phase project, and but we're gonna actually start in the second phase. And that phase is going to start in the third quarter of 2019. And it's a full depth reconstruction, meaning we, we will be working on the surface as well as the subsurface area. And then once we finish that, we'll move into the smaller area phase one of the project and it's um, a 17 million dollar project and it's jointly funded by this the state of louisiana um, dotd and the city of new orleans it's an 80 20 split and right now we, we got some pretty good comments and questions while we were in our breakout sessions but if anyone has any questions about the project timelines um any work that that um, you have questions about with regards to the full depth reconstruction, Grace and I can answer those questions in the next few minutes that we have. Yes. Uh, what is the space that's going to be covered in the two phases? Grayson, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, my name is Grayson. I've worked for the city for about a year now. Um, so there are two phases. The second phase is going to be going from Broadway to exposition, which is the eastern portion, excuse me, I'll stand yeah. up. Um, so Broadway to exposition is going to be the first phase under construction. Um, and you asked about the limits of that in terms of the width of the road or? No, I just wanted to know what the distance was. It's, a, it's like a half a mile for from Broadway all the way to um, what was Calhoun, but we now reduced the limits of it to exposition. The next phase will be coming a year later due to some environmental issues that we have with <coughs> some grand pavement that's underneath the road. So we've got to deal with those pavers and go through a whole environmental process for that, which is why, and also so that we don't fatigue everyone with having both phases of this construction project going on at once. How far will that go? The limits of that project go from exposition to Nashville. That's my question. You know, accessibility. Yes, sir. Um, so the plan is when construction is going on through the park, there will be one travel lane used throughout the construction period. Um, and the first portion of the park work will be from Broadway to West Drive. Then after that gets done, then we'll go from West Drive to East Drive. Uh, while there's at least right now, while we're in the design phase, the plan is for uh, traffic to move from the CBD through west on one way, and any traffic coming through would go, going east would go up to St. Charles and be detoured. <coughs> Again, this is in a preliminary and design phase. Um, we have not finalized those plans. 
Yes. Are you going to maintain two lanes of traffic during both phases? Negative. No. Um, there'll be one side of the road blocked for construction while the other side is open for travel. But, but the other side that's open for travel will just be in one direction or Correct. both directions? One direction. But what direction will that be? So while the work is going on through the park, if you're coming from the CBD going west, then that will be open. If you want to go east, you have to go to St. Charles and detour around. Thank you. Yes, sir. One of the biggest concerns is pedestrians. And of course, if a person's a driver and they run into a pedestrian, that's a big issue for them. But uh, have you all given, come up with any genius ideas to make it safe for both? Asking the city of New Orleans if we've come up with genius ideas. Um, <laughs> to make it safe. Uh, yes, there is a pavement striking plan in place in which to put high visibility crosswalks for pedestrians, both running um, along the path of the road and crossing the road, going to the park from the zoo to the park. Uh, but there's not a lighting plan for that, if that's what you're inferring. <laughs> of Magazine Street from, you said, like you're saying, uh, uh, Broadway uh, on, I mean, we'll be able to say, say if we want to get past the park, go through the, through, uh, the top of the, uh, the, the riverfront around and come down on Chapatulas, that'll still be open. No, 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 not if they close it. Yeah. Oh, if they close it at Broadway, right. Yeah, so it's shut down, so it's right. You boom. Be able to yeah, yeah, so well, okay, gotcha. Can, uh, you know, we can entertain more detail if you're available a little bit afterwards. We can certainly uh, show on maps exactly what uh, what they're thinking. But thank you so much. Appreciate you. And I have a few copies of the fact sheet available, so if you guys want to pick that up on your way out, that's okay. Take a look at what the scope of full depth reconstruction is. Um, and as Nikki said, um, this is a part of the capital improvement program, and a lot of information can be found on the roadwork.nola website. Um, it's an interactive map where you can find the segment of the road that you want to see that's being worked on if you live in Black Pearl or whatnot. You can click on it, it'll tell you the scope of work, when it will be um, actually worked mm -hmm. on, and the budget for that. I just had a question about the project going into the park. Is there any effort to maybe come up with an entrance to the park from the back of the Definitely talk to you more about it outside so I get a better understanding of what you're actually asking. Um, okay. A way to get to the fly while the road, while the project is going on. Yeah. Uh, Only yeah. Happens. yeah, so they'll be hanging around for a few minutes afterwards so you can uh, uh, corner them and uh, get more specifics. But thank you so much for coming out. We really appreciate that. Uh, so when we talk, uh, let's go back to the schedule for a moment. So as we said, this is meeting number two. Uh, meeting number three will be in less than a month, or almost exactly a month, uh, April 5th. Information is back there in the back. So what we've been doing, the, the first half of this effort has been to listen, to gather information, and to understand what your needs are, what your desires are, what your vision of the park is. And uh, tonight's session really helped quite a bit, in some cases, clarified priorities, in other cases kind of reopen some deeper questions that we need to focus on over the next 30 days. So the next 30 days will be one for us, the design team of synthesis, of bringing these ideas together, formulating a, a plan that achieves the, the, the greatest good uh, and fulfills the mission of the Audubon Institute. Uh, there was a question raised in the first meeting about when will we see a draft. We will have a draft available, a draft final, if you will, for the next meeting, for meeting number three on April 5th. 
uh, the intent is to uh, present that to the group and get collect uh, final input, final comments, final commentary, and then to finalize the, the master plan. So certainly there is much that we need to be doing over the next 30 days. Uh, I can't emphasize enough, again, we, the survey wrap-up is at the end of March, so we have three more weeks to be able to gather uh, from, from the website information that was shared, gather your information, your neighbor's information. We're so proud of the fact that we've got 900 uh, respondents already. We'd love it if that number doubled by the end of March. Uh, there were a number of folks at our table said, well, can we still provide input since, you know, in some cases there were a lot of voices at the table. The answer is absolutely. Over the next 30 days, if you've got something to say, find a way to say it. If you're not sure how to find a way to say it, uh, our information is available for me and Tracy and the SQ Dumas Ripple and the, and the, uh, uh, the, the landscape uh, team. Uh, we're always open to ideas, suggestions, phone calls, emails, get the information to us, let us know what your thoughts are, and we're gonna be compiling uh, that uh, for in preparation for meeting number three. I think, uh, Kelly, I wanna turn it over to you for closing comments, so thanks again for everybody's participation. That's exactly it, thank you all very much. Your comments are really quite valued. I encourage you to go on the website, provide your comments, go to the survey, do the survey, we're looking at all of that. It's all very important. But thank you very much for your enthusiastic response to being here today and participating. And we look forward to seeing you on April 5, same place, 6 to 8 p.m. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, one, one, oh. one, one last comment. Sorry. No, it, thank you, Mr. Duncan. Uh, one last comment for all of you all. Please do, if you haven't taken the survey, please do it. But also for anyone who is interested, uh, our videographer Jonathan is here and we're actually going to be taking video testimonials. If you have something that you want to say that you haven't been able to say tonight, now's your chance. Jonathan will be here uh, with those. We will be posting the video from tonight's meeting as well as the PowerPoint as well as the video testimonials by this Friday. So please continue to go to that uh, website that's documented on all of the handouts and you'll be able to continue to review and see all the information from tonight. So thank you all very much. Thank you for your feedback and on behalf of all of us up here, uh, we, we so appreciate you coming out tonight and spending your evening with us. Thank you. My name is Judith Bigpen. I love the birds and the trees and the peace it affords in the busy, hectic pace of life. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate and have a voice in this process, but I do have to say that the stipulations of holding the golf course outside of this planning process and the zoo do a disservice to the credibility of the entire planning process because those two things are huge commitments, developed recreation commitments that benefit only a small portion of New Orleanians and visitors. And the, um, the fly is open to everyone. And um, it really feels like this is a process to pave the way for paving part of the fly. I do, and they happen all the time. I, as a kid, I lived in Metairie, and after you moving out there, after my parents divorced uptown, and I would ride my bike once I could make it that far, all the way to the fly, from Metairie Road and Airline Highway and back road, you know, mostly on the residential streets, and I would end up at the Riverview, and it was, amazing to be Riverside, Mississippi, watching the Mississippi and the boats. And that's my favorite thing about this park. And the others walking the path. And um, I even enjoy lunch occasionally at the golf course, although the food quality is kind of up and down. <laughs> I haven't been there recently because the last time it was so bad. <laughs> and <laughs> I know, but the veranda is amazing. But recognizing that not everybody can afford a meal on the veranda. So it really does feel like the park is, has split public 
and that's uh, that's not fantastic. I think we need to preserve those open spaces that we have. My name is Ed McGinnis. My favorite thing about Audubon Park is early in the morning, listening to the birds in the lagoon, and also walking along the river and seeing seeing all the green space and seeing the soccer fields and just seeing listening to the birds wake up in the zoo in the morning. I was expecting a public comment period tonight. I think the breakout sessions allow folks to focus on those particular issues that are important to them. I think the public meeting tonight has really been a, a breath of fresh air. Yeah, my favorite memories of the park are, are looking actually through. It starts at the house early in the morning with my two young girls waking up in the morning and see if we had any moldy bread to go feed the ducks in the morning. Hi, uh, my name is Christian Sowska. Uh, you know, I, I guess uh, in a really small space, relatively, there are a lot of different options and a lot of different things. You know, I think that kind of embodies what the way our house kind of feels about New Orleans. It's still sort of a small town, but you have all these big city amenities and within the park, the golf course, the jogging trail, the exercise locations, the the, 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 the river view by the, by the fly, the fields. So there's, there's a lot that goes on. And so having all of that in one, and a zoo, and a zoo, and a pool. So there's a lot, that's my point. And it's all in a one small, relatively small space. And that's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I don't usually go to a lot of things like this, um, but I, you know, have been, not being from here, I spend a lot of time in this area and, uh, it, it was great to have people's voices heard. Uh, I wish there was a little less um, anger. Uh, it seemed like a lot of people certainly are passionate and that's great, but um, wish there was maybe a little less hostility. I, I, I have a lot to help, you know, raised my kids, raising my kids there. Uh, so certainly lots of memories with them running around, uh, even in college, uh, stumbling through the park back through, uh, back to college. Um, but I guess the favorite memories would be, you know, walking to the fields with the kids along the river, telling them stories about what I was doing when I was in college. Uh, maybe a sunset or two. I, a lot. <laughs> Jonathan Ferrara. My favorite part about Autumn Park is really twofold. One is riding my bicycle around the park and walking with my children. And the other is Carrollton Boosters and playing, my son playing soccer and hopefully baseball and just accessing the fly and, and having a great time on weekends and meeting a lot of diverse people from across the city that I wouldn't normally meet. I think it's good to have public interaction in anything that's going to be a public space and, and I think the meeting has gone relatively well. It's my first time attending it, but I, a good discourse. Both sides got to talk about it and I think there were some relevant points raised on both sides and hopefully they can be resolved. I'm, I have two young children so we're creating memories every day going in the park, whether it's playing uh, soccer with my son or baseball or just walking around the park or ride, my son riding his bike for the first time. So it's a lot of different great memories in Autumn Park and I'm glad that I live close to it. Chad, uh -huh. hip and steel, uh, the birds. Getting out on the jogging trails and hearing, uh, you know, all the squeaking and squawking and uh, cooing that goes on and uh, just being part of the environment. Yeah, the first one was entirely too dry and uh, the setup was really formal. It was almost like a church or a jury procession. But this time around you had tables and it was a lot more engaging um, and gathered at the front of the room. It ended in the same formal procession. So maybe there's a way for uh, the formalities to be left to another time without being rude to the guests. Uh, yeah, just meeting up with a few friends, my, Kate, and Josh, and uh, getting together, doing a little sketching. My name is George Quaron. Uh, I'm a resident of New Orleans, have been my entire life. Um, yeah, and I just came out tonight to show my support for preserving our parks, but actually also getting the community to engage in the upkeep and the uh, facilities in the park as a whole. And I know one main issue people have is the expansion of the Carrollton Boosters Association encroaching upon the green space in the park. Now, in my personal opinion, where the boosters location is, it, it was underutilized. I, I was more upset when the hills were torn down um, to make way for the soccer fields, but it's all done. Can't make any changes about that. 
But instead of expanding the facility, there are kids now playing on the fields. But the green space is for when those kids grow up to have children of their own so that they can barbecue and have picnics out on the waterfront because it is the last bastion uh, uh, or area for just regular folks in the neighborhood to go visit. And um, I mean, all that's really needed and uh, for the entire area is just minimal upkeep, you know, cleaning maybe some, uh, the park is in top shape. I have no problems with that whatsoever. The fly, it could just use uh, some minor touch-ups, replace some of the benches, a fresh coat of paint here and there. Other than that, I'm really impressed with how the uh, Audubon Commission takes care of everything. I, much better than Orleans or on uh, any government entity would be. The fly is, is one of my favorite parts, but to be honest, it's the, uh, there, there's this uh, bench by the stone bridge. And I just remember going there as a toddler and feeding the ducks. So that, that's my favorite part. Aesthetically, it's probably the fountain right off St. Charles. I think it's an excellent uh, uh, visual point. And I think along the river, we could actually benefit from another fountain up there for people to sit around, have some uh, puddles, or, you know, the little areas for dogs to drink out of basically. This is my first one, and I'll be honest, I was thoroughly impressed. It's much better than I thought. Um, the crowd, in my opinion, could have been a little more friendly, a little more well-mannered, but I understand people are very passionate about this. This is where they spend their leisure time. There's not much, you know, that's very, uh, people are sensitive about where they spend their leisure time. Um, other than that, yeah, I think that everyone did a, a bang-up job. Um, especially with taking input from such polarizing views, at complete opposite ends of the spectrum, but it allowed uh, the facilitators to gather information on where the majority of the crowd stood. I mean, if you have a, if you have an opinion about the park, then you need to get your butt here and express the opinion because the commission itself, actually engaging with the public, it is thoroughly impressive to me. Uh, I've never seen such actual community engagement to a degree like this. So my hat's off to them. The ducks, feeding the ducks with my parents, that, that will always be uh, just a, a sentimental time capsule to me. I wouldn't trade that for the world. The, the park's given so much to me. I feel it's responsible that I look out for it so my own family can form the same memories.